If you have your Bible or Bible app, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. While you're turning there, let me say to all the dads in the building and who are watching online, Happy Father's Day. We love you. We appreciate you. We value you. And if you came today or you're watching today and you're looking for a feel-good message to pat you on the back, I'm sorry. (laughs) This is not a feel-good message today. This is an urgent message from the heart of God. An urgent message. To begin with, let me just, while you're turning there to Ephesians chapter 6, let me share some facts and statistics about fathers and families in our nations. Listen to this. Research shows when a child is raised in a father-absent home, they are affected in the following ways. Kids who grow up in a home without their dad, whether the dad has passed, whether the dad is permanently out of the home from divorce, or whether the, the father is just absent. They live there, but they're just not in the kid's life. Listen, kids have a four times greater risk of poverty when dad's not in the home. Four times more uh, risk of being poor. They are more likely to have behavioral problems when dad is not in the home. They have a two times greater risk of dying in infancy when the dad is not part of the pregnancy and the dad is not in the home to welcome that child home. Um, They're twice as often they will die in infancy. A child that doesn't have dad in the home is more likely to commit crime and they're more likely to go to prison. I don't have this statistic written down, but I read it this week. I believe the statistic was 84% of people in prison, men in prison, did not have their dad in the home. Think about that. Eight out of ten. Eight out of ten. Young girls without dad in the home, they're seven times more likely to become pregnant as a teenager. Children without dad in the home, they're more likely to face abuse and neglect. They're more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol. They're two times more likely to suffer obesity. And in the world we live in, they're two times more likely to drop out of school. Those are some pretty sobering statistics, aren't they? And that's not all of them. I could probably spend the rest of our time today, if I had all the notes and all the things that I had read and and, and, uh, researched, ahead of this and we could talk about the negative effects of absent dads folks what it amounts to is this we live in a world where the family unit that god designed is under attack there's just no other way to say it okay uh if you are my age or older we didn't grow up in that kind of world okay we did have a drug problem we got drugged to church when we were taken to Bible school and our parents taught us right from wrong but we're living in a world today where the culture and the government tells parents oh we need to raise your children and to that I say a big fat no no oh yeah and no no Family unit God designs under attack. Our children especially are under attack like never before. Just in the last couple years. And it's not coming from the drug dealer down on the corner uptown. Okay. It's not coming from the predator that's stalking the playgrounds, even though that happens. Okay. They're under attack in the school system. And I know I'm treading on some thin ice here because I've got a daughter who's a school teacher and I know there are others in the room that have family members who are school teachers and I love them and I appreciate them that they are godly examples and they're they're actually, listen, when people ask me about my daughter, I say, listen, she's on mission in the school system. That is the truth. She is doing ministry in the marketplace. She is, she's taking Jesus into a dark place. Our school system, which is run by certain, um, educational organizations and they're the power behind it it's dark and their agenda is dark and i'm just telling you the truth based off of what's out there i you don't have to listen to me you can look for look for yourself you can look at it okay 
Our children are under attack like never before. They're being taught literally what Isaiah the prophet said and, I, and what's recorded as Isaiah chapter 5. That they will say right is wrong and wrong is right. And what that means is all the things that we know to be right and true and just from this book. Listen, God, does, God is the one who determines right from wrong. You know, I've already determined in my mind if somebody challenges me as a pastor and say, who are you to tell me what's right and wrong? I'm just telling you what he said. I'm just the messenger. God has said what is good and right and just and what is wrong and immoral and evil. God has determined that and it doesn't change. It's not changed and it won't change. They're being taught right is wrong and they're being taught that what is wrong is right. And here's the thing, dads, and I'm talking mostly to dads today. Our children and our grandchildren are hurting. They're under assault and they're even confused about who they are. Listen, four-year-old children, five-year-old children, six-year-old children should not be confused about who they are. Okay? And that didn't just happen. Don't let anybody, don't let any scientist, don't let any researcher, don't let any professor, don't let any doctor, don't let any talking head on a TV screen or on your video screen, don't let them tell you, oh, well, that's just normal for a child to have that confusion. No, it's not. You're planting that garbage in their head. Yeah. And you're putting it on the, the, the shelves of their libraries at school. And you even have teachers who are immoral, who are pushing it on them and telling them, have an open mind. Who knows what you might be? <clears throat> Dads, we got to do something. I say we've got to do something. God gave me this message for our fathers today, okay? He's saying we've got to do something. God has sent you to be the answer. Are you listening? Or the dads, or the grandfathers, are you listening? Or the men in the room, are you listening? God has sent you to be the answer. Listen, I know, I know, we're living in a culture right now. If you're a man, if you're a man, I'm going to say this, and it's, I know it's going to be controversial, but you got to hear my heart, and you got to hear it with the heart of the Spirit. If you're a man, you're in the minority in this world now because of your gender. You're being pushed down. It's the, it's the fight against patriarchy. Okay? They're fighting back and pushing back against patriarchy. Okay? And I'm not, listen, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about uh, equal pay and all those kind of things. Listen, if you're a man or a woman, if you do the same job, you get paid the same thing. You should. And if you're not, shame on your employer. And report them. Do what you got to do. But we're living in a culture right now, if you are a man, you have got a target on your back. You, They want us to be quiet. They want us to be silent. They want us to sit down. They want us to say yes and amen to everything that they have to say. And I'm here to tell you, that's not God's plan. God wants you to hear that today. That's not God's plan for you. If you're a dad or you're a granddad, you are the answer. You are God's answer. Liberal left, the culture, even some in the church today will not like this statement, but it's the truth. God has sent you, Dad, to lead. He sent you to lead. Let's read these first four verses. Ephesians chapter 6. Before we read it, it's Ephesians 5 and into 6. It's the Apostle Paul. And he's talking here about... Just some good foundational teaching about the family and how husbands and wives ought to be towards each other, how parents should be towards their children and children towards their parents. We're going to pick up, though, verse 1 of chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And here it is, verse 4. And you fathers... Do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. 
God is saying in that passage, Dad, it's your job. It's your job. It's your job to teach your children to know God. It's your job to teach your children to know right from wrong. It's your job to be the disciplinarian in your home. It's your job to take care of these things. It's your job to look at the path of your child. It's your job, many of you as grandparents, to look at the path of your child and make sure that they are on the right path, that they're not getting in the ditches. And if they get in the ditches, it's your job to go with grace and mercy and pull them out and rescue them. It's your job, Dad. God intends for you, man of God, to take the lead. And I want to talk about three areas. First of all, He wants you and I to lead our children. The culture wants men to be silent, but God says we have a mandate to speak truth in love and guide our kids to the truth. If you are allowing the school system to raise your children, shame on you. You need to repent. And folks, I'm going to tell you something. I know that it's happening. Not necessarily in this room, but I know that it's happening. Listen, I, my daughter went through public school until she got to high school. She finished her last three years of high school at a Christian school. And I thank, so, I thank God so much for that. But before that, <clears throat> she was in public school. And some of the things that I saw and some of the things that I knew godly Christian people were allowing their students to take part in at school, I was, I was aghast. I could not believe it. Could not believe it. I, I've talked to educators too, and I understand where things are at right now. You know, we talked about partnering with the school. I talked to the school counselor once, and we took school tools. Let me tell you how much your school tools mean to them. I the first time I took school tools to the elementary school, the school counselor cried. She said, "We have people come by all the time and ask, do you have anything to help? Do you have any resources?" We, your families, families need help. And they didn't have anything that they could give and they didn't have anywhere to send them. So I gave her my number. And they did. From time to time they would call. We would help. We would do different things for families. And we helped the family that, that had a, a fire in their home. We took them some things. We'd taken school tools on how many times. But one of the things she told me was, listen, in our school, we don't even have a PTO. We have a TO. You know what PTO is? Parent Teacher Organization. Or PTA, Parent Teacher Association, right? They could not, in a school of 500 plus kids, get one parent to get involved. Not one parent. I was told that it was so bad that they would send home, the teachers would send home. They used to do this with Kara when she was in elementary school. They'd send home a homework assignment. And then it was sent home a little slip of paper. And as the parent, you were supposed to sign that saying, yes, we did the reading and she did her assignment. There it is. They could not get teachers to sign off on the homework. And when asked, they said, you're the teacher. I don't have to teach my kid. Listen, if you do that, you get what you get. If you're going to let the school system, if you're going to let the government, and, and don't think for a minute that the school system is not part of the government. <laughs> The government is funneling it all down through the school system. Listen, that's why we got kids out here that are calling what's going on in America. People, listen, when we stand up and we say, God bless America, and we salute the flag, and we put our hand over our heart at the, at the national anthem, you know, it's a sense of nationalism and pride. But you've got a, you've got a generation of kids who are just now at voting age who think that that's fascism. They've been taught that godlessness in the schools. Just because we stand up and we would, we would fight for the flag and fight for our freedoms and we celebrate our freedoms, they call that fascism. Folks, that's what's being taught in the school system. You, dad, you, dad, not mom. You, granddad, not grandmom. You need to be all up in the business of your kids. You need to know what they're being taught. You need to know who their teacher is. You need to know what they stand for. And if you find out any of this nonsense, they're teaching them stuff and tell them, don't tell mom and dad. You need to be all up in the school board and you need to let them know. Folks, this is serious. This is real. This is not a drill. The devil wants your kids. And if we just sit back and let somebody else teach them, he's going to get them. 
Do you hear me? Verse 4, he said, it bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Folks, this book right here, this is the owner's manual for life. When you bought your new car, it had an owner's manual in it, didn't it? It, had every, it answered every question. If you, if you could read the language it was printed in, <laughs> it answered every question that you had about your car. What's that like? You look it up. There it is. This book is our owner's manual for life. And not just our life. You know, I, most everybody in this room, you know, we, we figured that out. This is our owner's manual. This is what we've got to go by. This is what we've got to live by. This is how we've got to live if we want things to go well for us. But you know what? Your kids haven't learned that yet. They've got to learn that. I'm going to step off here and I'm going to say something too. And this might be controversial. And if you have a problem with it, you come see me and we'll talk about it. It's not my job to lead your children to Jesus. It's yours. As the pastor of this church, I'm here to be a spiritual guide and a spiritual help and support what you're doing with your children. But mom, dad, dads especially, Father's Day, dads especially, it's your job to lead your kids to Jesus. They need to see godly dads and godly granddads. They need to see you pray. They need to hear you pray. They need to see you in the Word. They need to see you in church with your hands raised high, praising Jesus, your Savior. They need to learn that. And you're the only one that can teach them. He said, bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. This book is the manual for life. It has not changed and it will not change because God said right slap dab in the middle of the Bible, I am the Lord God. I do not change. Look at your neighbor and say, God ain't changed his mind. He's not going to be here, let me tell you. <clears throat> Speak the truth in love. Listen, if you've got older kids, teenagers, in the world we live in, it's hard. Because again, it's not the drug dealer on the corner. You might think on Friday night your kid's in their bedroom and you know exactly where they're at and they're safe. Do you know what app they're on? Do you know what they're listening to on that phone, on that device? Do you know who's talking to them on that device? I, I, I could share so many stories along this line. I'm just going to share one. And it really bothered me for two reasons. Back... About four weeks ago, five weeks ago, our phones went off. Mary's phone and my phone went off together. It was an Amber uh, Alert. There was a 15-year-old, turned out to be a 16-year-old girl who was missing. And uh, <clears throat> oh, wow, this is, you know, every time you hear that, you just kind of get a sick feeling in the pit of your stomach. What, what has happened? The next day, more details came out. Mom had taken her to school at a school in Stanley County and had dropped her off. And after mom's car was out of sight, instead of going into school, she turned around and she went and got into a car with an Alabama license plate on it. She had been in her room. Mama's, she's safe. My girl's at home. She's safe. She was in her room in some kind of chat room or Snapchat or TikTok or something. And this... 35-year-old man from Alabama was talking to her and enticed her to get in the car with him. She got in the car with him. He drove seven and a half hours overnight from Alabama to be there the next morning. And then he drove her seven and a half hours back to Alabama. Because they had cameras at the school, they called a picture of the license plate, knew what kind of car it was, and knew who he was. Guess what? He was already in the system as a convicted predator. Thankfully, she was unharmed. Now, that upsets me for one thing. Listen, as a society, if we want to make this stuff stop, we've got to do something about those who do it. Okay? We've got to do more than just smack them on the wrist and put them in a database, okay? Not gonna go too far down that road. But it made me so mad. 16 years old, 
Do you not have better sense than to be talking to a 35 year old man online? But then it makes me mad too. Mom and Daddy, where were you? Why did you not instill in that child how dangerous that is? That girl could have come home in a body bag. Listen, Dad. It's your children that are in the balance. Listen, Granddad. It's your grandkids in the balance. You got to be involved. You're the answer. If you don't love them and you're not teaching them and you're not looking out for them, nobody else is going to. Pastor, you're getting loud. Yes, I'm getting loud because this is the wake up call today. We've watched and watched and watched as our culture has just gone down this slippery slope inch by inch and it's getting a little faster, a little faster. Folks, it is falling off the edge now. And I'm telling you, our kids are not safe. Not even in the schools. We've got to speak truth and love to our children even when they don't believe it. Listen, this is, a, this is a truth. If you don't believe it, go back and look at the COVID statistics. Oh my goodness, I said COVID. <coughs> People listen to them say over and 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 they read it and they heard it and they heard it and they read it over and over and over and over and over and over again. You have to wear a mask. To the point people just acquiesced and they started to believe, yeah, I've got to wear a mask or I might die. When from time immemorial before that, the only people who wore masks were who? The people who were actually sick. Since all that has died down and, and the powers that be have declared that the COVID emergency is over, the statistics have quietly come out and said and proven the mask did no good. Pastor, why are you bringing that up? Because they said it over and over and over and over again until people finally started to believe it. Listen, even if your teenager does not believe you, tell them the truth over and 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 over again until they start to believe it. Their life might depend on it. Dad, granddad, God has called you to lead your children. But He didn't call you to stop there. He's calling you to lead in the church too. Some of you are like, okay, I'm not sure where He's going with this. I don't know how comfortable I feel about this. Listen, when I was growing up, it was always the ladies who did everything in the church. They always taught the Sunday school. They always taught, well, we didn't have children's church then, but the Sunday school. They always taught the vacation Bible school. They all, they did all the church events. They organized everything and the dad showed up and ate. <coughs> and cut the grass. Don't get me wrong, I like to eat. And I appreciate those that cut the grass. I really do. I told you Terry does a great job. Dads, we got to get involved in the church. Our kids need to see it. Do you hear me? Didn't get a single amen. God is calling us men to step up and lead in the church. How do we do that? We lead by example. Don't just send your kids to worship. Take your kids to worship. Take them. Take them. Listen, there used to be, and there were some churches that grew to be huge, large churches by doing this. They'd go buy old school buses and they would fix the engines up to them so they'd run another 50,000 miles or whatever and they would go through the neighborhoods and they'd pick up kids every Sunday morning. Mom and dad be standing there at the door looking like they were half hung over and there goes the kids off to go to Sunday school. And the Lord says, no. Take your kids to church. Worship with your kids. Listen, when I got in trouble with the nursery people at the church I served at when Carol was born, <clears throat> everybody was so excited that we were having a baby and 
And we had some wonderful ladies in the nursery. Don't get me wrong. I had no problem with any one of them. We come walking in with her one day and they're like, oh, lit as ever, lit as ever. I said, no, we're going to take her into church. And they're like, take her into church. And so we walked on in. And it kind of got back to us that people were a little upset that we took Kara into the church. You don't trust me with your baby? Okay. No, it's not that. We had a plan. We wanted her to be in the room when we were worshiping God. We wanted her to be in the room in the presence of God and to learn the presence of God. One of the reasons probably she's a worship leader today and she ushers us into the presence of God so well is that she learned from an infant what it was like to be in the presence of God. We would stand there and we would get her out of her little carrier and we would rock her as we're singing worship songs and singing hymns and lifting our hand. And when she got big enough to where she could stand up a little bit, I had her standing on the pew, the back of the pew in front of me, and she was bouncing up and down to the worship songs. And she was praising Jesus when she wasn't even old enough to know the name Jesus and say the name Jesus. We've got to worship with our children. They need to see that. Listen, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm going to be transparent with you. Today's just been a day of transparency for me. I don't know how far I'm going to go down this road, but I'm going to be transparent a little bit more with you. I was the biggest person in my church growing up. I was certainly the tallest person in my church growing up. I was a whole head and shoulders taller than everybody in the church. So when you got an almost 300 pound guy raising his hands like this to Jesus and swaying around, people start giving you a little bit of room. And I was self-conscious about that. So I would just stand there. I'd sing the songs. Maybe lift. I didn't even do this. I'll be honest with you. I didn't even do that. And the Lord told me, as I, as I grew more and more in the things of God, no, you need to be free to worship. Dad, you need to be free to worship. Dad, you need to be free to worship. And if you feel like reaching your hands up to Daddy God, you reach your hands up to Daddy God and say, I love you. If you feel like coming and getting on your knees at an altar because you feel so blessed to be in His presence, then you do that. And guess what? Your kids need to see that. They need to see you worship Jesus. Because just like you, they can't see Jesus right now. We don't see Him with our eyes. But when they see you interact with Jesus, oh, wait a minute, there must be something to this. And think about it. We've set our kids up to fail concerning this, haven't we? You give me that tooth and I'll put it, put it under your pillow and the tooth fairy is going to come and give you a, When I was a kid, it was a quarter. I think, what's the going right now? Ten bucks a tooth now? I think. I mean, kids are making bank when they start losing teeth. They're like, little Johnny, hit me in the mouth so I get another one. We told them the tooth fairy was real and then they found out there wasn't no tooth fairy. We told them the Easter Bunny brought that basket. And then they found out there wasn't no Easter Bunny. Oh my goodness. We told them Santa Claus brought all them presents. He'd come down that chimney. I, we didn't tell care of that. We told her the truth about who the real St. Nicholas was and we just told her, listen, all your other little friends probably think he's coming down the chimney tonight. Don't spoil it for them. <laughs> but we set our kids up. We told them all these things, all these people, all these uh, beings who are real and then they found out one by one by one they're not real. And the whole time we've been telling them who's real? Jesus. And then we wonder why they question the faith when they get a little older. No, your kids need to know Jesus is real because they see him in your life. I can tell you right now, I believe in Jesus Christ today because I saw in my mother's life a true faith and I saw her interact with him. Just like when you're on the phone, they see you talking on the phone, they know who you're talking to. They don't see that person, but they know you're having a conversation with them. They need to see that. Listen, don't be afraid to be real in front of your kids. They don't need to know all the details, but they need to see you come through difficulty and receive the victory that Jesus gives at the end. They need to see you in the midst of the struggle and how you rely on Him. They need to see your faith in action. They need to see you flexing your faith muscles. 
Because when they see that, when they see that, they'll turn to Him. I'm just going to go here. You know what? We're just kind of doing that today, aren't we? Ronnie, when your kids see you healed and whole and how you held on to Jesus, they're going to turn to Him with their whole heart. Amen. You hear me? That just this straight from the Lord. He just dropped that in my spirit. They need to see the other kids in this room when they're with us. This is one of the reasons why we have the kids in here for worship. I don't just send them to children's church. They go there to get their lesson on their level because right now, what I'm saying right now, we just... But when they're in here in this room, they need to see us worship. They need to see us interact with God. They need to see us weep before the Lord. They need to see and hear us pray. They need to see the power of God moving in our lives. Amen? Amen. We lead by our effort. We find a place in the church and we begin to serve. Find your place. There is a place for all of you. If you don't believe that, read 1 Corinthians 12. We're not going to go there today. We don't have time. 1 Corinthians 12 says that you are all members of the body and every one of you is important. Find the place and serve somehow. Lead by your confession. Let the people around you, including your children, hear in your own words that you believe in Jesus and that's why you serve and follow Him. Let them see and hear your faith. And then lead by your confession. Oh, I just said that. Lead by your confession. Lead by your effort. Um, Find your place and serve. Lead by your example. Don't send your kids to worship. You worship with them. Dad's the church needs you. Your church needs you. I'm telling you. I'm putting you everyone on notice. And not just the dads. All the men in this church. This church needs you. You're important. You lead your children. You lead the church. This one's a hard one. This one will take a little more effort. And it'll take a little more courage. God is saying we need to lead in the culture again. And before any liberal lefty loony accuses me of saying, oh, he's just a patriarchist and he just wants to keep women down. No, that's not true. I love the ladies of our church. I love the men of our church. I love the children of our church. And we're all equal in the sight of God. And we all have value and we all belong and we all have a role to play. And no one's greater and no one's lesser. Okay, I said it. That's clear. But we need to lead in the culture. We need to not be silenced. This is going to be a little harder, but we need to stand up for what's right when opportunity is presented. I alluded to it earlier. You need to be in the business, in your kid's business when it comes to school. You need to know what they're learning. You need to know the books they're reading. That's a wonderful, you know, you, know, you may not want to sit down and read for 30 minutes with your kid each night. But when you read that book, you find out exactly what they're putting in their hands. Give you an example. There have been many of these examples like this. And it's not just been men, but this one just struck me. It was a man. And he went to the school board meeting. And he stood up in the school board meeting. He went to the podium. They gave him like five minutes or whatever. And he stood up there and he called the whole school board out because I can't believe the stuff you're putting in the library. I mean, literally, some of the books that they're putting in your elementary school age kids library is so pornographic they have been told in the school meetings when they read portions out loud, you must stop that or we, there are children in the room, you must stop that or we will arrest you for public indecency. But it's okay to put over here for little Johnny to go read in the library. No, it's not. And granddad, when you find that out, you need to have your behind at the next school board meeting. You hear me? And I'm not talking about going in with guns blazing. You need to be thoughtful and you need to be prayerful and you need to decide with the Lord what you need to say and you need to put your points down, A, B, C. And if you need help, come see me. And you need to let them know, this is not appropriate for me to read. My child is not going to read it. We've got to stand up. If we don't stand up, nobody's going to. Do you hear me? Do you believe me? This father went in and he courageously called the school board to account for all of it and asked. He did it so eloquently. He was very thoughtful in what he had to say. He had it all planned out. And 
he left to a standing ovation. Because other parents, listen, you're not the only one. You might be the first one to stand up for what's right, but the rest of them are saying, yeah. And they're right behind you. You might just find out there's more with you than there are against you. He's calling us to lead in the culture. He's calling us to be courageous. Sometimes it's intimidating to take a stand, but ask God for courage and the right words to do what you have to do. Two things. Lord, give me the courage to do this. And Lord, put your words in my mouth. I don't want to mess this up. I don't want to mess it up. Here's the thing. When you stand up for what's right, your kids are watching. Your kids are watching. And by your example, you are leading them. Let me say it to you like this. We already talked about this. We talked about worshiping together with them. We've talked about taking them to church and taking them for worship. We've talked about all that. Here's the truth. And if you don't take away anything else today, dads, granddads, if you don't take away anything else today, take this away. Faith is caught. It's not taught. I'll say it again. Faith is caught. It's not taught. Let me explain what I mean. You can teach them this book from cover to cover. Every word. You can force them to read it every day. I knew some kids who were like that. And they lead some of the most godless lives you and just terrible lives you could ever imagine. But when you live out true faith in front of your children, when you truly worship God in front of your children, when you truly pray a sincere heartfelt prayer and they know, hey, he's not just saying words, he's talking to somebody. Who's he talking to? They catch that. Just like catching a cold. You hear me? Except when they catch faith, it's something that they never get rid of. And it transforms and it changes their lives. Amen? Amen. I'll read it again, verse 4. He says, bring them up in training and the training and admonition of the Lord. As we fulfill this command of God, we are pointing our children in the way they should go in life. That's your job, Dad. How many of you ever heard of <clears throat> orienteering? Anybody? I know the sergeant in the room has. Orienteering. Nobody. Really. You know what a compass is, right? You've heard of a compass. I got a compass in my in my pocket right here. As a matter of fact, all the dads and granddads are getting a compass today. And you'll understand why in a minute. When I was in the scouts, there was a, a lot of these different little badges that you could earn. And, and each one was a different topic, you know, safety, emergency preparedness, first aid, crafts, whatever. And they had one called orienteering. And what orienteering is, is you take a map of the area that you're in. And more times than not, we would do this. We would do it out in, uh, this is before GPS, by the way, okay? You take this map, and you're out in the middle of somewhere, and they give you, you're at point A, but they tell you there's point B, and they have point B marked on the map. And, of course, the map doesn't give you any kind of um, anything to go by. It doesn't tell you, okay, go to this building and turn left or turn right. It's not like giving directions downtown. But you had to take a compass, and you had to orient that compass to true north, and then you had to orient that map to the north on the map to the compass, and then you could look up from that map, and you could look from your point A where you're at to where your point B, where your destination was, and you could find it. And we would do little drills, and there would be like little scavenger hunts, and, and you'd go from point A to point B to point C to point D to point E, and you'd pick up different things, and, and once you got all these things together, you could assemble them like a puzzle or whatever, and, and the team that did it the fastest, you would, you'd win a prize or whatever. Orienteering. You had a map, and you had a compass. Wow, that just worked out that way. This book, this is the map. This is the map for life. It tells us where we are and it tells us where we're going. This compass though, Dad, this compass is you. Your kids need you in their life to point them in the right direction. Are you hearing me? 
And in our kids today, today need that more than ever before. This is not the world we grew up in. The same stuff we had to deal with is out there. It's out there. And kids fall into that all the time. But there's just a myriad of other things out there and more opportunities out there to get into trouble than ever before. And if that wasn't enough, we got people we're supposed to trust our children to who are already leading them astray and they're pointing them in the wrong direction. Do you hear me? God's Word is the map, Dad. You're the compass. Like I said before, I'm their pastor. I'm your pastor. I'm here to support your efforts. I can help all that I can and try to put them, point them in the right direction. But you see them more than I do. You spend more time with them than I do. You're around them more than I am. You are the one they're looking to. I promise you, if something were to go down, some kind of event were to go down in this room right now and our kids were in the room, they wouldn't run to me. They would run to you. You hear me? Your children are looking to you. Sometimes they act brave and they act like they got it all together. First of all, you and I know that's not true. Second of all, they're really looking for you, Dad, to point them in the right direction. They're looking for that. This is not a feel-good message. It's a call to action. And God wants each one of us as dads in this room, as men in this room, not just the dads, but men. Listen, men. Men in the culture are under attack as well. He wants all of us to respond today. He's looking for men who will answer the call to lead. Not asking you to come up here and do this. Unless God's asking you to come up here and do this. And He can. He can call anybody at any time. But whatever it is God's asking you to lead, whether it's your children, your grandchildren, lead in the church, lead in the culture, do whatever it is God's calling today. And this is what I want to ask you. If you're willing to answer that call today, if you're a man in this room, just the men, if you're a man in this room and you're willing to answer that call, I want you to stand right now with me. I want you to stand. And by standing, Dad, you're saying, I'm going to lead my children. I'm not going to let the world lead them. I'm going to lead my family. I'm not going to let TV and TikTok and, and whatever else lead them. I'm going to lead them. You're saying, I'm going to find my place in God's church. I am a member of this church and not just on a roll. I'm a part. I'm, I, I'm needed and I'm going to lead in the church. I'm going to find my place. And when the opportunity arises, I am going to lead in the culture. I'm going to speak up the truth in love with the words God puts in my mouth. I'm pleased to see every man in this room standing. I want to pray for you, can I? So we do this, just lift a hand or both hands if you want to. Lift it to the Lord. And lift an open hand. Lift an open hand. Because an open hand, it takes an open hand to receive something from God. Amen? Jesus, I thank you for these men in this room. I thank you for men who are watching right now online and may watch this later. I thank you, Lord, that they're willing to answer your call. They're willing to see that you have placed them where you've placed them to be a leader in their family, to lead their children, to lead their grandchildren. You've placed them in this church body and you've put them here with purpose to lead here as well by their example, to lead through worship and lead through their prayers and lead by their faith, their example of faith. And Lord, they're even willing, if you go with them, by your spirit and your power and your unction, put words in their mouth, they're willing to stand up in the culture and say, this is what is right. This is the way we should go. Lord, I pray that by your spirit right now, each man is standing, Lord. Let them receive your power, the power of your spirit to stand and to do what's right. Lord, let them receive the understanding to speak the right words at the right time to their children, their grandchildren, the people that they're around in the church and, and the people they're around on their jobs and out into the, in the world. Lord, I pray that you give them the right words. Fill their mouth with words. Even as you filled the mouths of the prophets, Lord, to speak your holy word.
Lord, let them speak the right word in the right season that points people to you. I thank you for these men. I thank you for the dads. I thank you for the granddads. Lord, I pray your blessing on them. Strengthen them. Make them mighty men of God. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Don't sit down yet. You can put your hands down, but don't sit down yet. As I was preparing this today, God spoke something else to me. And this is going to involve any, anybody else who wants to be a part of this. The Lord spoke to me and said, there are people that are going to be in that room. There are going to be people who are watching who did not have a good situation with their dad. They did not have a good relationship. There are going to be people who are going to hear and they're going to hurt going to be hurting. There are people who are hurting from the relationships they have with their dad. I heard a testimony of a dear sister in Christ the other day about her mother's relationship with her dad. Relationship of abuse over 12 years. Listen, I'm not reading your mail. God's not showing me anything specific about anybody. But this is what I feel like God wants us to do. He wants the dads to put their money where their mouth is right now, this morning. If you're a dad here and you're willing to lead in the church, He wants dads today, not the elders. He wants dads today to pray for people who need prayer this morning. So this is what I want to ask you to do. I want the dads who are willing to do it. I want you to just step out. You don't have to come forward, but just step out to the aisle. Step out to the end of your pew. And if you're here today and you've got a father wound, you've got a hurt in your heart from the relationship with your dad, and you need prayer, and you need healing in your life from that, I want to encourage you. Find a dad. Find a man who's standing right now. Go to them and let them pray for you and give them a hug from your Heavenly Father. I'm going to tell you something. Your Heavenly Father is the perfect Father. Amen? He loves you. He adores you. And He wants you to be whole. If you're here today and you need prayer for anything, maybe not even a father wound, maybe it's just something you need prayer for, something that maybe your dad's no longer with you, but you wish you could go to your dad. There are men of God in this church who are dads. They're standing all over this room. Find somebody if you need prayer right now. Some of you do. I see tears. Some of you need prayer. Some of you are just missing your dad. And you wish you could hug him. Find a dad in this room. And let Jesus give you a hug through them today. Don't wait. Just go ahead. Go ahead right now. Find somebody. Find somebody. Find somebody. Find somebody. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. There's one. There's one. Begin to pray. There are men standing here and they're ready. And they're willing to pray. They're willing to put their arms around you and give you a hug from Jesus. Maybe your dad's in the room. and Maybe, maybe you need your dad to put your arms, his arms around you. Go to your dad. There's one. There's one. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, let there be healing in this room right now. Let there be healing in this room right now. Jesus, let there be healing in this room right now. As these men of God are praying for their children, as these men of God are praying for others who are in the room right now that need a touch, they just need wholeness, they need to feel the arms of a father today, Lord. Let them feel your arms today. Let them feel your arms today. Brother Tommy. Brother Tommy. Go back there and put your arms around Trisha. Just begin to pray for her. Begin to pray for her. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you're doing in this room right now. Jesus, thank you for what you're doing in this room right now. Thank you for what you're doing in relationships right now. Thank you for what you're doing between fathers and children right now. Thank you for the, the beginning of healing in hearts right now. 
Oh, Jesus, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for men who are willing to stand for you and to be your arms extended to people right now. Lord, we just love you for that. We love you for that. We love you for that, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, let every wounded place begin to heal. Let every broken heart be mended. Let relationships be drawn together and strengthened with cords of love. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Would you all stand with me now? Hallelujah. Father, thank you for this time that we've shared together today. Thank you, Jesus, for being with us. Lord, as we prepare to leave this place, Lord, we're not leaving your presence. We know you go with us. But, Lord, we ask you, let your provision meet every need of your people. Let your protection go with us into each and every circumstance we encounter. Let your healing flow in the bodies and the lives and the relationships of the redeemed. And, Lord, give us your peace. Father, let the peace that passes all understanding go our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, we pray.